Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Strange things that have happened to you that you can't explain. Have you ever experienced something where you look back and think, WTF happened there? Was that actually real? I once saw a woman run down my hallway and into the bedroom. I gave chase, but there was nobody there. It confused me then, and it still does now. I often look back and wonder, WTF, you. Home alone dwelling in my room. Suddenly a loud crash in the next room. Go check it out. Father has a lot of trophies on a shelf varying in size and shape. Half of one is lying on the other side of the room. Examine it and it looks like it is broken in half. Check the shelf to see where it came from. Two rows of trophies. See the other half in the far row, like four meters away from the other one. WTF.GIF. I could never explain what happened there. This happened when I was 22, living in Fort McMurray. I was babysitting my eight-month-old cousin with a friend. We're just sitting and talking in the living room, about 11 p.m. Suddenly, a weird floating worm about a foot long floated through the glass of the picture window. It was translucent brown, slowly undulating like it was swimming through the air. It was covered in wiggling hairs all over. It floats through the living room and down the hall into the nursery. My friend and I panicked and followed it there. Get there just in time to see it float through the glass window there. We freak out. My friend starts crying and refuses to walk one block home. We turn on all the lights and sit facing the window until my aunt got home. We still talk about it sometimes. It was so freaky, and my heart was pounding so hard when I saw it, I could barely breathe. No idea what it was, or why it could go through glass. Posted this once before in a nope thread, hope y'all enjoy. About five years ago, at Boy Scout camp for the week. No real reason to expect spoops. I have been coming here for at least five years and not once have I ever felt uneasy, nor have I ever heard of anything paranormal going on in camp. The camp was a pretty good size, around six or seven campsites, not including camp staff accommodations. Each of the campsites were pretty much completely apart from each other. Maybe two would be within eyesight of one another. But other than that, it was a five to 10 minute walk between the rest being in a pretty desolate part of the Miles Standish State Forest so there isn't much in the way of noise except for critters, and at night if it's cloudy you can't see your hand in front of your face. Honestly loved it out there so serene. In each of these campsites they set you up with a leader's cabin at the edge of the campsite and a latrine beyond that. The only scary story ever told that involved my campsite in particular only involved death. There was no mention of ghosts or anything of the sort. A homeless man was said to have been smashed one winter and in his attempt to find shelter attempted to climb into our campsite's latrine. These latrines had walls that go up almost to the ceiling and then stop with about a foot to climb in through. Being drunk, he slipped stepping down from the hole and cracked his skull on the concrete floor. Being one of the deeper campsites, he wasn't found till spring. Not a pretty sight. I've seen the stain and being young assumed it to be true. And in my defense, when the story is told, it's never embellished nor told to scare people. It's always an offhand thing, just kind of stated matter of factly. This is where I come in. It was my last year at camp and I was rooming with a buddy of mine, Jerry. Jerry had a flashlight that had like six raised bumps around the light bulb. In between our classes being bored as hell stupidity ensued. Fast forward 30 minutes. He has now broken the flashlight, but he has succeeded in leaving imprints in the table by slamming the light down onto the wood bumps downward. It's now night and it's cloudy out so it's pitch black, and now we don't have a flashlight. No reason to be worried we hop into our bunks in the tent, which is more like a PVC triangle with a tarp over it, and get to sleep. Middle of the night I wake up and have no idea why, usually I'm a very heavy sleeper but something has disturbed my eternal slumber. This isn't like a normal awakening though I'm not groggy I'm wired. Every fiber of my being is screaming something's wrong. My senses begin to sharpen up and I hear this loud cry and it sounds human. Now you best believe I'm 110% awake. I listened again and now I made out the solitary word, help. Being an older scout and used to kids sleeping, talking and crying due to homesickness, 
I assume a physical human being needs me. I jump up and strain my ears to make sure I'm not losing my mind. And sure enough, help comes out of the darkness again. So certain now someone needs me. I throw on my pants and yell out, Hello, who needs help? I am a step from going outside when I hear the cry again and now it just sounds like an owl. Still really on edge, I wait up because it'll be damned if I misheard an owl three times. Not only three times, but to such a degree I was ready to go into full on super scout mode. When I think back to it, I remember the night being silent when the crying was to me human. But that may have been me just being too focused on that one sound. After hearing the owl hoot another two or three times, my heart rate slows down. The sounds of the forest seem to creep back into full swing and I try going back to sleep. Just as I feel myself drifting off to sleep, I start seeing that redness you see when light hits your closed eyelids. Well, I assume it's now morning and I got no sleep. I open my eyes and to my horror, the flashlight that Jerry smashed into submission, the same flashlight that even when taken apart and put back together would not turn on is now sitting on the floor, shining bright, right at me. Trying to convince myself it's just a coincidence. I attempt to shut it off and go to bed, but no, of course not. The flashlight is still so broken it won't turn off, and I can't remember how the damn thing opens so I leave it face down pretending it's off. Wake up next morning lights off again, would have said it died but tested the batteries in another flashlight they were still good. Confused and a little more than rattled I tried to just forget the whole thing. That afternoon an older scout and scoutmaster meeting at leader's cabin got informed that another older scout heard a voice calling him outside of his tent, believing it was a younger scout. He got up to check it out, but whoever it was, was gone. We kept an ear out for any other outburst during the night, and boy did I hope we'll hear one because it would prove it was just a scout and nothing more. But no more of the voices at night, and that there is my only unexplained event that's ever happened to me. Hope this was worth me typing out. Sorry for the shitty green texting, not a great writer. B8. Be playing hide and seek with my sister and friend. Be me hiding under mom's bed. My friend hides in the wardrobe in other room. Coming ready or not. JPG. My sister finds me immediately. Friend suddenly starts kicking the wardrobe door. Uh, let me out, let me out. I come out from under the bed and follow my sister to the wardrobe, two steps behind her the whole time. He's panicking. I get to the wardrobe and starts pulling on the door with sis. It's shut tight. WTF? There was no way to lock or jam the door and there's no handle or grip on the inside to hold it shut. I stand with sister looking bemused. My friend is screaming like a banshee at this point almost kicking through the door. Door suddenly opens and he falls out onto his knees almost crying. Screw you! It was you! I look at sis knowing it wasn't us. It was you! I could feel you pushing the door when I climbed in. Sis tells him to F off. It wasn't her. My friend runs home crying like a coward. He didn't come around as much after that. He swore blind he could feel someone pushing the door as he got in the wardrobe. My sis was coming from the other direction and found me in seconds. After that I was behind her the whole time. It wasn't us. Be me. Live in a small village. Go to a party at sea where tons of fireworks and rockets are lit and fired into the sky. People all around me. Had a great time as the fireworks were quite impressive. Got bored after a while and started to focus behind the lights in the sky to try and spot something out of the ordinary. I was some UFO fanatic as I sometimes spot a few stars moving very strangely at night. See a dot moving very quickly and at the same time I suddenly hear a low pitch buzzing noise in my head, get an intense headache while that happens, can't control my head, forced to look down on its own. It stops after having no vision of the sky, feel lightheaded and almost lose balance, feel creeped out but decided to look up again trying to figure out what the hell happened. After some time I focus again, this time I spot that thing again and try to fight against the wave of the pain and urge to look down, but fail. The fireworks ended shortly after that. I didn't notice that two hours had passed, start walking to my car, have a huge sense of dread and fear as everything around me suddenly starts to look far bigger than usual as if I am sinking into the ground. Start walking faster until I reach my car, start driving quickly until I reach home. I never talked about this to anyone, and now I have agonizing pain in the right side of my skull, and it never stops. It feels like as if it's inside my head and it gets stronger and stronger each month, and medication is not helping at all. B11. Relaxing at the beach with my family. 
My mom and dad are busy drinking and chatting and my elder sister is busy reading a book. I hunt for shiny rocks on the shore. I got far away from my family but not too far that I can't see them. I saw a creature in the sea crawling to the shore. I was terrified at what I saw. A squid-like creature as big as a lion with sharp teeth. I couldn't speak due to shock, but I eventually let out a scream and ran away back to my family. I was crying and couldn't speak for half an hour. When I finally cooled down a bit, I told my family about the creature. My dad laughed and decided to check this supposed monster. I led him to the place where I saw the monster, but the monster was long gone. My dad found a crab as small as my little finger and teased me with it by saying, were you scared of this little small fry? I still remember the face of that thing and it scares me still. Something similar happened to me. B13, sitting with mom at 1am watching prisoner cell block H. I was a strange kid. The living room door suddenly bursts open. Boom. A woman about 80 runs in. Looks like a corpse. Face is gray and wrinkly like an old witch. Mom and I almost jump out of our skin. WTF. Old woman points at us, mumbles something, then runs out of the room, slamming the door behind her. Mom and I look at each other for a split second, then give chase. Mom runs to the front door and I run up the stairs. She isn't upstairs, comes back down. The front door was still locked from inside. The chain was still on. She searches house again. Nothing. There's no way to put the front door chain on from the outside, so the woman couldn't have gone through the front door. If she'd ran upstairs, I doubt she could have survived a jump from the second floor, so I would have found her. I have quite a few to tell. I'll tell you the most recent one, which is from some months ago when my dog died. 11-year-old dog. Gets sick in the lungs. Doctor says it could have happened at any given time. The age didn't matter. At her deathbed, I kissed her head goodbye. Stares straight at me for probably two minutes like she's saying, it's all going to be fine. Dies some hours later. Later when the moon was up. Very windy and cloudy. I stand at my window, sadder than I've ever been. For some reason I can't explain. I just look at the sky. As the wind flew by, the clouds shaped a face very reminiscent of my dead dog. Where the pupils would be, there are two stars. Staring directly at me. Exactly like on her deathbed. She would have been 12 years old some days ago. I'm still sad. I used to live in an apartment complex. Had a room which also had my computer set up. Go to sleep one night, wake up. The entire desk is covered in liquid that appears to be water. Look up and the ceiling is not wet or has signs of water damage. There were no full cups at my desk that the cat could have knocked down overnight. Also the liquid did not have an odor so the cat didn't piss on it either. Ask mother what the hell is going on. She has no answer. Dad finds out and he has no answer either. Somehow my computer table got totally drenched in water overnight while it was dry the day before. To this day I could not find a reasonable explanation as to why my table got water on it. I doubt my parents were pulling a prank on me, and if there were, they would have admitted it by now. Possibly related around this time my maintenance man died. He lived in the building. And the next door apartment neighbor told my mom stories about how the toilet seat would constantly be up even while knowing she keeps it down. This is what happened to me when my family moved into a house in Mount Beauty in Victoria when I was younger, when I was seven or so. Moved to this house, three bedrooms and one bathroom in the outer suburbs of Mount Beauty, nothing unusual about it, wasn't an old house either. It was built in the late 1980s. Right behind the fence was thick bushland, and you could see Mount Bogong from the backyard. Second day in the house I went outside, and there was a teenage boy sitting in the tree behind the fence. It was a tall gum tree and it towered above the fence. He must have been around six feet. I remember him as being very tall. He had dark red hair, light blue eyes. He looked a bit strange because his nose was quite high up from his mouth. This didn't make him ugly or anything. It just made him look unusual. He just began talking to me casually, asking if I liked the new house and stuff like that. I wasn't at all weirded out by him, perhaps because I was young. The weird thing was, though, I remembered him speaking in a language I had never heard before, but it registered with me completely, like he would speak, and I would automatically translate what he was saying in my head. I'm not sure how to spell his name properly, but it was pronounced Tevarath. He became a good friend of mine, and would always stay behind the fence. My family just dismissed him as being an imaginary friend. Things got strange when he first encountered my father. 
I remember because I was sitting against the fence and he was sitting on the fence. If I remember we were talking about the trucks I was playing with, he would always recognize the toy vehicles I was playing with and tell me facts about the certain vehicle. Anyways, my father wasn't at home much due to having to leave town to work, but he was home for the weekend and came outside to see what I was doing. The moment he stepped outside, his eyes locked on him, and he didn't say word. He just stared at my father. Once my father went back inside, he told me I need to be very careful around him, saying that my father was a terrible person, stuff like that. It was odd as well, because he never paid attention to any other family members except my father. It was around this time he also told me that he came from the top of Mount Bogong. I probably could have got more information out of him. He never lied to me and he always told me the truth, but I didn't really care about his origins because I was seven. I also asked him if he had a mum and dad and he said yes, but he had not seen them in a very long time. I also don't think he was a ghost, as he was always physical. He never vanished or anything. If he had to go, he would walk off into the bush. One day my father had come back into town and this distressed him a lot. He kept saying my father couldn't be trusted and that I wasn't safe. He asked me for permission to come into the house. I said yes, of course, not knowing all the problems it would cause. So we're sitting up eating dinner, and I remember him sitting in the lounge room watching us eating dinner. I was talking about him, and my family was laughing about it, and my father said, Oh, why doesn't he come sit at the dinner table? And with saying that he got up, walked over and pulled out a chair and sat down. My family saw the chair move and freaked out. My brother was into black magic and all that stuff, and since my mother was super religious, accused him of bringing a demon into the house. My mother also told me all this crap about religion, saying I shouldn't talk to the guy anymore. A priest also came and blessed this house. It didn't bother Tevarath one bit. In fact, when the priest was over, he just sat in the lounge room watching television. Stuff heated up again when my father returned to the house. Tevarath was legitimately distressed when my father was in the house, and wouldn't leave me alone for one second when he was in the house. If I was in the toilet, I remember him standing guard outside the door, and if I was in the bath, he used to face away from me standing at the door. He would never tell me what he thought my father would, just that he feared for my well-being. Now this happened around five months later, and yes, I kept seeing him for the duration of my stay at the house. He never scared my family again, though, after the incident at the table, because my mother had threatened to kick my brother out of the house, thinking he has brought a demon in or whatever. The police came to the house asking to speak with my father. He wasn't there, of course. He was out at work. Just as they were about to leave, a massive crash sound came from my father's office or whatever it was. It was kind of just like his room, and we never went in there. The police thought we were lying about my father not being at home, so they went into the room with permission from my mother. A metal cabinet had all of its drawers ripped out and then thrown to the floor, and on the ground was numerous illegal images of children. I saw this because we all went into the office with the police. Anyway, to make a long story short, my father had pretty much been running across the country Jimmy Savilling children, fooling us by saying he had work. My brother also admitted he was abused by my father to protect me as he promised not to touch me. Anyways, after that we moved away. I asked Tevarath to come with me, but he said he couldn't leave, and said we'll meet again one day. It's been 15 years and I haven't seen him since. When I was a bit younger, I would sometimes start to take a shower having forgotten to throw a towel over the rack. My dad, since he's a good guy, would usually throw a towel over if he noticed I didn't have one already. So one day I'm in the shower, no towel on the rack and someone steps by and tosses one over. All I saw was a silhouette, but I assumed it was my dad. So after the shower, I get out and look around for my dad upstairs so I can thank him for the towel, but he's nowhere to be seen. I finish getting dressed and go downstairs. I see my mom and ask her where dad is. She reminds me that he's not home. So I asked her if she threw me a towel while I was in the shower, to which she replied she hadn't. My mom is not in touch enough to play some kind of prank like that. I know it's kind of benign and it wasn't even that scary at the time, but I still wonder who threw me that towel. Be 14 or 15. Me and a friend used to take our older brother's cars out joyriding at night because of the edgy teen phase. Around 3 a.m. I have been driving around since 12. Around this time we often got bored, heading home through a residential area. Coming down the street notice cars in the parking lot of what I believe to be a church. As we roll closer, I notice there's two cars. One van with the two back panel doors open. One car parked with the trunk open. Three men standing around doing something they shouldn't. 
I know this because as soon as they spot me, the man slams his trunk shut, just as the two other men close the van doors as they all quickly enter their vehicles. The two cars quickly pull out of the parking lot and begin heading in my direction. We joke that we interrupted a drug deal. As I continue driving, I notice both the van and the car still trailing me, which is odd because I would drive like an asshole doing 20 to 30 miles over the speed limit. Paranoia sets in, so I decide to turn into a neighborhood I know fairly well. In my rearview mirror, I see both make the same turn. I proceed to make many different turns in the neighborhood. The van can't keep up with the speed I'm making turns, but the car is still keeping up. I quickly make three right turns to make a loop around. Speed as fast as I can out of the neighborhood. Saw a van cruising slowly as if checking if I parked on the street. Speed home. No other cars spotted the rest of the way home. I don't really know what I had seen or why the men began to follow me. This isn't creepy pasta or any bullshit. This is something that has been happening to me recently. Thought X would like to know and maybe even direct me on where to go. I've been sick for a while. Probably the worst sickness I've ever been through. I'm pretty vulnerable to the flu, especially during changes in the weather. My sickness began on Thursday and has gotten worse throughout the weekend. At first it was just a headache, but this headache was much more severe than ones I've previously felt. It's felt like someone has been squeezing my head to the point where my eyes were about to pop out at any moment. With each passing night, I found myself sleeping more and more. That is, until Saturday. I could barely get any sleep that night. I kept going in and out. Disturbances such as frequent trips to the bathroom and coughing kept me up. But as it became too late in the night, my body was finally succumbing to much needed rest. Though I was finally dreaming, I was dreaming about my room, and my room in the state in which I left it when I went to sleep. In fact, I was in my bed in the exact same position. I forgot to turn the light off the last time I got up, so my room was quite visible and nothing out of the ordinary was present, minus those common quirks that usually come with the dream world. I saw a blur pass over my eyes, and in a moment's notice I realized I was not breathing. I awoke from my dream, but my body did not move an inch. I was paralyzed. Not even my head nor my mouth could move, only my eyes. I could still feel my body, but my brain was not sending any signals. I looked down, and there I saw my right arm tangled around my neck. In a panic, I tried to move it, but it wouldn't budge, nor would my left arm, which I attempted to use to unravel it. A little anticlimactic, to say the least, I regained control of my body and was able to force my right arm to let go on my neck. Nothing similar happened the rest of that night, and while I laid there attempting to get over my sudden frenzy, I couldn't keep my mind off of one detail, the way my arm was wrapped around the neck. Most people's hand will only get so far that it touches the back of their neck. When I laid there helpless, I could see that my hand had made a complete loop around my neck and was touching my right shoulder blade. In other words, my arm had to have been extended by some means. Dislocated, perhaps? That could explain why I wasn't able to move it. But I didn't pop it back into place or anything afterwards. I did wake up the next morning spitting out a lot of blood. This was spitting, not coughing up. If I was coughing up blood, I would have seen a doctor. But it seemed my gums had burst in my sleep. My jaw was pretty sore as hell. I probably hit my head on something when I was sleeping. Sunday night, my headache was at its peak. I was in so much pain, my skin had turned pale. I was both sweating and shivering. Every noise felt amplified, like the noise was happening just inches away from my ear. I found the largest and most soundproof pillow I could find in my house and laid it on my head. Though they didn't quite go away, the headache and noises were dimmed. I knew I wasn't going to get any better than this, so I finally made peace and slept. You could probably tell what's going to happen next. I seem to have forgotten about my arm's erratic behavior the night before. Maybe I assumed it was all just a dream. My hard-earned sleep was once again paused, for I realized once more I was suffocating. I could feel someone forcing the pillow against my head, preventing any oxygen. My face was being crushed. I tried moving any part of my body I could, but to no avail. My legs would not kick the intruder, nor would my arms push him away. 
It was at that moment I recognized there wasn't just anyone trying to kill me, but it was myself. Well, to be more clear, my right arm, with the last available breaths to me under the pillow. I controlled my breathing, attempting to pump my body full of energy. At last, I could at least feel my feet. I inched them off my bed, and my legs followed. The sudden force of movement was enough to restore energy upwards, and I rolled myself out of bed, the pillow getting thrown off of me in the process. I gasped for air, each breath was painful, but at least I managed to stay alive. Last night I pretty much knew something wasn't right at all with my arm. Saturday night I felt like it could have been a medical issue, but Sunday night had me second guessing. I'm not one for paranormal beliefs, but there's no reason to not take any precautions after nearly suffocating to death two nights in a row. I took a roll of duct tape and taped my right arm to a pole in my room near my bed. I was uncomfortable, but it made me feel safe. I kept scissors in a close enough distance that my legs could reach them, but not my arms. That night my headache and coughing have dissipated by quite a lot. I was in heaven compared to the nights before, in a relaxed state. I turned over on my side in a far more comfortable fetal position. It took me a few minutes to realize my hand was no longer taped, and not only that, right next to my face. The pipe in my room I taped it to was broken, the duct tape shredded. My hand started to move on its own in all sorts of alien manners. I tried to contain it with my left, but it ended up forming a fist and punching me in my lower jaw. I slammed my hand into the pipe, hurting it as much as it hurt me. It didn't bruise, and thankfully it didn't break either. It did stop the bizarre behavior the rest of the night. Needless to say, I'm pretty spooked. I just want to sleep and recover from my illness. But I'm at the point where I don't want to sleep. Regardless of whatever the hand shit is, go to the fucking doctor, dude. Arrive home after a midnight walk. It's 4 a.m. Nobody's home. Start packing some stuff in a bag for the next day. Clearly hears a metallic sound coming from the kitchen as if something had fallen to the ground. Don't know why but feel spooked as f.png. Grab something to throw just in case. Slowly walk the dark corridor in the direction of the kitchen. Turns on the light. Nothing out of place. Still spooked.jpg. Looks all over the house for something that could have made that noise. Nothing out of place. Still spooked.jpg. Decide to go back to my kitchen and grab a knife. Just in case. Enter the kitchen. Grab a knife. When going back to my room, the knife in my hands falls to the kitchen floor, making exactly the same noise that I heard 10 minutes ago. Feels like I've traveled back in time and it was me who caused the metallic sound. Spooked as f.avi. Walk the dark corridor back to my room with knife in hand, having the feeling that I would find myself standing in the room. But nothing out of place. This really freaked me out that night. I'm on my phone looking for a bit of a thrill so I was reading through these. I'm on vacation otherwise I would just get on my computer that I was foolish enough not to bring the charger for. Please excuse any odd autofills or typos. After getting to the bottom of the thread I felt the need to share my story. It is something that keeps me up at night. I'm not sure if it is extremely creepy, but I can't dismiss it as a random trick of the mind or happenstance. Any insight would be incredibly appreciated. In order to fully understand why what I have to share bothers me so much, I need to give you some general background on my family, particularly my brother. We are a lower middle class family. If I am being honest, my family is rather uneducated. I am the first to go to college and none of my family has any interest in science or math. Their hobbies are watching TV and watching movies, this is in part due to the fact that so much time has to be dedicated to taking care of my little brother. One year and two days younger than me, I am 24. My brother has muscular dystrophy. Upon hitting his 14-year mark, he could no longer walk and had had trouble with arm movement since he was 18. He isn't particularly bright, but he's incredibly kind and loving. I help take care of him when I visit but he doesn't get out much and can only partake in the activities of my family as he can't drive or really hold game controllers. Anyway, getting to the story. It's November 2014. I am at my house with my girlfriend. Suddenly I get a sinking feeling, so much so that I tell my girlfriend that something bad is going to happen. She assures me I am okay as I am uncharacteristically anxious. I relax after a while. 25 minutes later I got the call. 
My mother lets me know that my brother has been in the back of the ER for 20 minutes being resuscitated. I rush to the hospital. I have known this would come, though I wasn't expecting it soon. He wasn't even on a breathing machine yet. When I get to the hospital 15 minutes later, I'm expecting the worst, but hoping beyond hope he is alive. He is alive. Oh, thank the God I haven't believed in for years. Thank everything, but he wasn't breathing for 20 minutes. His heart stopped beating for a good 10 of that. Extensive brain damage, I can barely think in the throes of my sobbing. Can I see him? Can he talk? Yes. No. Will he ever? It doesn't look good. I go to talk to my still seizing brother's ear. His eyes flutter open with each pulse of the breathing machine. I can see the wrongness in his crooked, unseeing eyes. I love you, Anon. I love you so much. It's your brother, Anon. It's going to be all right. The faintest flutter of recognition. His eyes flutter open once more, this time meeting mine. They close slowly and don't open back up with the compression of the breathing machine. The beeping and noises begin and I am hustled out for the to begin resuscitation again. They succeed but more damage comes with it. The next weeks are hard for me. I have to come to terms with my brother being dead. My little kind-hearted brother. Dead. The time comes to remove the breathing tube to see if he can breathe on his own. If he can't, he is now on the do not resuscitate list. I say my goodbyes and tell him to let go if he needs to. The tube comes out with only the nurses, the doctor, my mother and I in the room. The awful, horrid beeping begins. More nurses arrive, but the doctor just shakes his head and says, do not resuscitate, do not resuscitate. He begins turning black from the lack of oxygen, seizures, but then the eyes shoot open and a ragged, strained voice quietly sputters, four, nine, thirty seizures. The doctors didn't have an answer. I want to know why numbers were the last thing out of my brother's mouth. Why he locked cold eyes with me as he said them. Why I felt so awed and terrified when at that moment I couldn't feel anything. Beyond all of that, why I know there was one more number and in fact am sure of it. Six or seven? Roll back to about eight or nine years of my life. Be me using Flatmate One's desktop PC, slouching the shit out of the afternoon. Hear loud pop to my back left from the center. Turn back head startled, thinking, the cat is up to business again. Cat stealthily slouched it off unnoticed besides me on the same sofa. Cat looking in the same direction as me. Human and cat in profound, silent WTF moment. Everything is apparently in order. Check everything in the general direction of the noise. Everything is apparently in order. Still WTFing. Flatmate 2 arrives to check the noise. More WTFing. We double check. Everything is apparently in order. We triple checked. We notice Flatmate 2's plastic eyeglass case missing from the otherwise empty table. We notice one of the case's halves, half A, casually slouching it off on the floor. Flatmate 2 and me WTF some more. We start looking for the other half. Find other half, half B, between crappy trash bin and crappy table legs snugly lodged. About a hand span off the floor even more WTFing. Evict half B from its chosen place of residence. Further thought, there was only one noise, meaning that two out of one, case splitting. Two, half a meeting on the ground. Three, half B getting lodged between the trash bin and table leg. Had to be silent, or all of them perfectly coordinated. Two humans and a cat witness. The dingy plastic joint between the two halves had no freaking way in the world of storing enough energy to do that. Except maybe at a molecular level. Half B trajectories are anomalous, or at the very least surprisingly convoluted. Trash bin was firmly hugging half B against the table. I hereby dub this phenomenon spite, splitting and impossible trajectory event, in which an object instantly splits in half, with each half covering a certain distance, apparently taking no time to do so and unimpeded by intervening objects. I'll bump with my own spoopy story that happened to me and a couple friends at the time. We'll call them Sue and Jerry. Sue and Jerry were family and just had an aunt that died. I went to the funeral and everything. Sorry if the green text doesn't work, I'm on mobile and I've never tried doing this on mobile. Be me about age 11, hanging out at Sue and Jerry's grandma's house. No one else was home but us. Trust me, we triple checked. We're all hanging out in the back sunroom of the house. Hear a loud ads banging from what sounds like it's coming from this little shitty storage room upstairs. Banging starts getting louder like it's coming down the stairs. We all look at each other in horror. 
Jerry finally opens his mouth, says some shit like he's on Ghost Hunters. Is anyone with us? Bang twice for yes, once for no. Two loud ass bangs. Nope, nope, nope. Dot JPG. Jerry looks at me. Anon, you watch the most TV, talk to it. I grow some balls since no one else would. Bang twice if you know any of us. Two bangs. Is it me? One bang. Suddenly Jerry thinks he knows what's going on. I bet this is my aunt that passed away and has some unfinished business or some shit. Remember we're like eleven, we obviously don't know shit about the spooky world. Bangs start getting faster and louder. We bolt. We all still talk about it. Apparently since then, Sue stayed in the house and it happened a few more times and she even has a voice recording on her old flip phone. I have a couple of other weird things that's happened to my family and I throughout the years, but they aren't that spoopy, just weird. Me and Buddy get back to his place. We haven't drank anything yet. Notice a weird white translucent tadpole hanging in the air, tail pointed down. Black dot, almost like a brain, inside the top head part, about half a centimetre diameter. Tapers into a two inch tail of see-through whitish, but firm tail with a black string right down the middle. Kind of like a spinal cord coming down from the brain. It's just floating there a few feet from our faces where we've crashed on the couch. Window is open because of a hot summer day, so assume it's some bug, wings flapping too fast to see or some shit. Reach out to swat it away. Thing just floats out of reach, absolutely no visible means of flight, dodges three swats in a row. Buddy passes hand over the top of it, thinking it's some bug caught in a cobweb or something, but no, nothing holding it in place. This goes on for about a minute, fascinated more than anything. Cannot work out WTF this is. Never seen anything like it in all of nature. How the hell is it consciously moving from swats and just hanging in mid-air? Buddy grabs a piece of paper and tries to grab it. After a few attempts he gets it. Squeezes it into pulp. We look into the paper expecting a squash bug, but nothing there. Not a smudge, not dust, nothing. This took place in Northwest England, and I went on a bit of a rampage learning about local bugs and stuff, never found anything that could even be close to what we saw. It's the only thing even close to paranormal to ever happen to me, and I still think it's got some rational explanation, though I hope it was an interdimensional bug coming for a toke with us. If anybody has any legit input I'm listening, this has always been a little mystery in the back of my mind. Have an opening manager shift on Sunday morning. Agree to work a closing manager shift on Saturday night, because Becky is selfish. Wrap up, leaving work at 11.30. Decide to take the highway home. The highway cuts through a forested area. I live in northeast Indiana. The highway has the orange phosphorescent guide lights or whatever on the sides. Doing about 75, cops are real ticket happy. So I try not to push my luck but I just want to get home and get the 4-5 to five hours of sleep I'll end up with. I didn't really realize it at first but all the guide lights winked out. I can't hear a thing. I don't have any music on because some asshole stole my radio a month ago and I can usually hear my car's engine. It's a 2005 Impala. Runs smooth but loud since it's the supercharged version. Looking ahead, my exit's in a mile. This shadow, hulking and on all fours bound soundlessly and effortlessly into the middle of the highway from over the sound barrier on the right side of the highway. I don't think much of it at first. I assume it's my brain being dumb and tired. Two yellow orbs pierce the inky darkness of its shape and look at me. I freak out, and I jam my foot on the gas pedal. It stares and almost glides over the other sound barrier. Those sound barriers are probably like 15 to 20 feet high at least. Almost home. Pulled over by a cop for doing 60 and a 30. Make up some bullshit about my dad calling me and needing my help because he had a fall. Dude sees I'm panicked, so he lets me go. I don't take that highway at night anymore. Home Alone, age 9. Eating some canned peaches cause it's tasty even if it is like 80% sugar syrup. I don't need teeth. Pick one out with my fork. So squishy it just falls apart off my fork. Instinctively follow it with my eyes. Blink. Gone. No splat. Look everywhere and can't find it. Nothing it could have fallen under. I can't find it anywhere. 
If you don't know those peaches are less solid than jello and covered in syrupy juice shit, so there should have been this huge splat over a foot across on the wood floor. B10 see Batman the animated series on TV, see Two-Face, I think it's the coolest shit to flip a quarter all the time. One day try seeing how high I can flip the coin with just my thumb. I have to keep chasing the coin because I can't aim. Starts hitting the ceiling so I have to take it outside. Go out on the blacktop and start flipping the coin cause it's silver and I can find it even if I miss the catch. The first flip goes pretty damn high but comes almost straight down. Get ready to catch it. Poof. Gone. Didn't even blink this time. No clang on the blacktop either. Search everywhere. Again I can't find it. Get super paranoid for a year and don't pick anything up I wanted to lose. Anything I do pick up is with a death grip. After a while I got over it and would pick something up and inevitably drop it and it would be there on the floor. Life goes on as normal. Age 16. Hanging with a bud. Both of us collect our loose change and occasionally go down to the bank to exchange it, then hit the arcade. Just a big ass vase full of coins. Weighs maybe 20 pounds. On the way to the bank I trip and the jar goes flying. Friend being a bro, tried to catch me and not the coin jar. Both of us watched it just disappear right before hitting the sidewalk. I looked for an hour and couldn't find a single coin. Buddy even has a panic attack which is what cut the search short. Been seven years and I'm still afraid when I pick stuff up. I work in a small shop and the other day I was working stock so I opened a fridge with a packet of ready cooked chicken and there was already a pack on the shelf but I could get the one I was holding out. So I took the packet on the shelf out so and placed the one I had in my hands on the shelf as it had a newer date on it. But here is where the strange thing occurred. The other packet of chicken that I put down had gone. I looked all over the shelf and it wasn't there, on the floor around me and on the fridges next to the one I was in front of in case it fell, but nothing. I told my friend who was working with me and he agreed it was weird. I said you saw me with the chicken, didn't you? And he agreed I had it. He looked around the floor and around the corner, but I hadn't moved from the spot. A very strange occurrence, and nothing similar has happened before or since with me. In the basement playing video games, hear what sounds like crying upstairs. I stealth up there and realize it's my younger sister on the couch crying. I'm a dickhead brother. I jump out and scare her. She runs up the stairs down the hall where bedrooms are. I'm a dickhead brother, so I decided to screw with her more. I turn the bathroom fan on and off over and over again. This is right next to her door. I see her bedroom light come on through a crack under the door and get ready to spoop her good. Time passes. She never comes. So I sneak over to the door. What the hell are you doing, Anon? I'm startled and cussing match ensues. Dun 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 dot JPG. If you're in mom and dad's room who turned your light on, why do you think I was crying earlier? I was trying to go to bed when the lights kept coming on. I was in seventh grade at the time and there was a boy in the eighth grade who for some reason I felt this weird energy pull about. Also I thought he was cute but I didn't have the courage to let him know. I saw him one night at the store with his mom returning video rentals. While I stood in the checkout with my mom I had the strongest pull and urge that I needed to go up to him and just say hi. Not just because I liked him but there was this feeling that was different from before. I have no words to describe it. It's not like I felt something was wrong, but the feeling I had was just not right. I chickened out and told myself tomorrow I will go talk to him, that no matter what I had to talk to him tomorrow. That night I couldn't stop thinking about him and the weird feeling I had when I was actively looking for him. Something wasn't right. And when the bell rang at the start of second period, my new feelings of him not being alive anymore were confirmed. Our teacher spoke to the class and said last night a student had taken their life. She didn't say the name or that it was a male yet, but I already knew it was him she was talking about. This wasn't the first time I knew someone passed before others, and it wasn't the last. The feeling for this one was different than the others, and I often have thought about the feeling and what made it different maybe because he took his life versus others I have known that passed in other more natural ways. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.